Now I'd like to hand it over to Cynthia West. Cynthia is at the U.S. Forest Service, and she's going to be talking about uh, trees, forestry, and carbon 101. Um, just as a way of introduction, uh, I am the D National Director for the Office of Sustainability and Climate with the U.S. Forest Service. This office was created in 2015, fairly new, and we got policy and actions to address impacts to public lands from changing climatic conditions to ensure a sustainable flow of benefits from these public lands. And this is a great job because it finally allows me to integrate my knowledge and experience across forest management, forest products, and research into a job. I want to um, give credit to my team. Our forest carbon team contributed greatly to this presentation um, as we work together to develop a better understanding and integration of forest carbon science into management and policy decision making. One of our great challenges uh, in the job is explaining the role of forests and forest products in greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, at the end of this presentation, I hope you're going to be able to communicate this relationship um, to uh, your, your partners, your colleagues, your neighbors, friends, and your stakeholders. In the U.S., um, forests, woodlands, and long-lived forest products are estimated to offset almost 20% of fossil fuel emissions every year. This is a very important sink. And people are interested in this benefit that comes from forests. They understand that forests are a sink for greenhouse gas emissions, so that is good. And they are concerned about the impacts of increasing global temperatures from bigger, more intense fires, storm events, and drought on our forests. Approximately half the weight of a tree is embodied carbon. Uh, and there is a great deal of interest in public opinion on how forests should be managed to sequester carbon and reduce the loss of carbon where appropriate. And as you can imagine, as a public land management agency, uh, we get a lot of comments and concerns. This cartoon pretty much sums up what people perceive about forest carbon and their understanding of a very complex top topic. They bring very different perspectives into the conversation, and it results in a, an array of competing narrow views. By looking at a leg, it is a tree, or only at a tail, it is a rope. However, we need to take a much broader view to see and understand how we are touching an elephant. Just like the elephant, people bring different narrow views of forest carbon and develop different conclusions regarding forest management and use. Uh, these different perspectives on how to conceptualize the forest system is the greatest source of confusion and conflict. Let's start with how we should not view a forest system. We call this the narrow view. Unfortunately, many people and even nonprofit organizations view the forest system through this narrow lens. In this view, the only positive management approach is maintaining forests, planting trees to absorb carbon uh, dioxide. So harvesting, prescribed burning, and most management actions are perceived to just release CO2 into the atmosphere where it stays there forever. This narrow view does not consider space and time and that forests regrow and take up carbon. We see this in comments we receive on our management plans and projects um, on a routine basis. But we know there's a lot more to the story. Forests are not just managed for carbon, but for many ecosystem services, including social and economic benefits, depending on the land and our objectives. At the end of this presentation, I want you to understand one thing, and that is keeping forests as forests and is the most important concept and not necessarily focusing on forest types and management differences. Keeping forests is forests, and I'll show you why that is important. Forests are dynamic biological systems. Left alone, they grow, age, die, and regenerate. This is a natural ecological system. Forests experience a natural boom and bust cycle to, to, um, on forest ecosystem carbon. 
Growing trees take up atmospheric carbon through photosynthesis and stored in the trees as a complex carbohydrate. Again, about 50% uh, by weight is that embodied carbon in a living tree. <clears throat> and this is considered the above ground carbon pool. When forests are disturbed by fire or insects or they age, they release carbon into the atmosphere. But carbon in dead and decaying trees persists for a long time in another pool, releasing carbon into much more slowly. Some of this carbon moves into the soil, which is another forest carbon pool, where it remains for a very long time unless it's disturbed. Approximately 50% of all forest carbon is stored in this very stable below ground pool. This plays out over many decades. And at any one point or time on the landscape, a forest may be in different stages in this progression. Now, I want to consider this progression in terms of a systematic um, biogenic carbon cycle. The inside loop represents the natural biological cycle of carbon through a forest. It's similar to the boom and bust representation I showed before. But forests grow, they remove carbon, and then they get old. They die or disturbed, release carbon, and regrow uptaking carbon again. Now, when we manage forests and harvest timber, the forest follows a different loop. Much of the carbon goes into a harvested wood product, which we can substitute for, replace materials that are more energy intensive to produce. We can also substitute for fossil fuel-based uh, energy, and this is considered to be carbon neutral. However, regardless of the pathway, the forest carbon cycle is a closed loop system. The forest will regrow and carbon will be taken back up over time, as long as the forest stays a forest. On the right is a fossil fuel system. It is an open system. Once, coal, um, once oil or coal or natural gas is burned and used for energy, the CO2 goes into the atmosphere. The CO2 has been stored for millions of years and cannot be returned in the same manner underground. It adds CO2 to the atmosphere, where it remains until additional carbon sinks can, sinks can be created to remove it from the atmosphere. Now, let's consider a little more complexity to our system um, by considering both time and spatial scale. Across any forested landscape, there are many stands with different processes playing out over time. Uh, perhaps we have different landowners with different forest types and different landowner objectives. And perhaps we even have different forest disturbance patterns. Some stands may be big, old trees with lots of carbon. Some may be young stands naturally regenerating after fire or newly planted following a fire or harvest. Some may, may be in the middle of a disturbance or releasing carbon or soon after disturbance with lots of dead and decaying wood. Others can be a mix of all of these more heterogeneous, so they're neither a sink nor a source, but a carbon neutral. But generally, the larger the scale and landscape, the more variability you get, and collectively you see smaller fluctuations over time. This is a broad scale view of the entire forest. And this view is more appropriate for evaluation patterns and trends over time. Remember, <clears throat> management actions should be examined over um, large um, landscapes. This slide represents how those large landscapes with different um, processes and different times and scale can average out over time and should be considered. All right, let's, let's take a, a look at the complete elephant now. And I want you to look at the appropriate ecological time scale accounting for all the carbon pools in a closed biogenic carbon cycle. On the left, you see a presentation of the forest system with a short time scale, small geographic extent, and narrow range of activities that influence carbon. From this representation, we can only conclude a net increase in CO2 from timber harvest. However, that would be not looking at the whole elephant. So we need to consider a longer time scale for a forest a broader geographic extent, and complete re representation of all the carbon pools. If we look at this view, we see a net decrease in CO2 emissions from a managed forest. The closed loop system depends on forests regrowing and reabsorbing the carbon that's been removed from the ecosystem. Carbon, <coughs> excuse me, 
This happens using best forest management practices. After harvest, if the land is converted to non-forest uses, then the cycle is broken and carbon is lost to the atmosphere and contributes to long-term accumulation, contributing to the warming of the earth. Taking a historical uh, look at land use in the U.S., we see the impacts of loss of forest. Changing land use from forest to agriculture, settlement, fire suppression, all impacted the age of forest and the amount of forest land cover in the U.S. Keeping forests as forests is a major concern with respect to carbon. Today, about 40% of the carbon lost during settlement has been recovered by, by regrowing and reestablishing forests. Unfortunately, we have this gain, a net gain in forests. However, there's still a concern that these gains can be reversed as population grows, increasing the use of long stored forest products and value of woody biomass as an industrial raw material is key to maintaining and growing the country's forest carbon sink. Public lands have long um, served a role in stabilizing the U.S. forest sink. However, what happens when we do not have regeneration after extreme fire events where soil productivity and the seed source are, um, sources are destroyed? The Hayman fire in 2002 illustrates the impact well, and we continue to observe it over time. Without regeneration, the estimated loss from this fire is high because the landscape cannot recover in time. Um, paleoecology records of extreme disturbance events suggest these landscapes may not recover for up to a thousand years and often do not recover to the same type of, of forest vegetation composition. Managing these fires for extreme fire risk is increasing in importance. The key to our success here, though, is wood utilization in markets. These two things are intricately linked. Using wood is good. If you um, like some of these uh, communication products and representations, they are available on our website, or I can provide them through the organization sponsoring this seminar series. One of the things that I ask you to do is to really take this broad view of the forest. At forest, as forest is the most important thing that we can do to maintain this important biogenic carbon cycle and sink. I want to conclude with the story of my old house. This house was built in 1895 from wood. The floors are longleaf pine, and I am confident the forest has regrown, and this house will continue to serve as a long stored um, carbon sink into the future for my grandchildren. Thank you very much for your time and attention, and appreciate uh, the opportunity to give you this bigger, broader view of forests and forest carbon. Thank you so much, Cynthia. So we're starting to see some um, good questions showing up in the in the chat. And I, I just uh, remind everybody that there will be a survey coming out at the end of this. And um, you can please just think of the things that your questions. So I'm writing notes myself of what I, what I really want to talk about next week. So um, we look forward to coming back with you next week, Cynthia.